Dear Mr. President, Cyril Ramaphosa, speaking in New York on 26 September 2018, you stated that there are no killings of farmers in South Africa. Last week, you attempted to clarify your comments by essentially doubling down on what you have said. From your comments and your attempt at a clarification, it is quite clear that you do not comprehend the extent of the crisis, nor its impact on society at large. In my hands is a copy of my recent book, Kill the Boer, in which the extent of the crisis, the brutality thereof, and the complicity of the South African government in the crisis is illuminated. It took three years to write and the book contains more than a thousand source references. I have declined to accept any of the proceeds from the book. The book, the one that I'm holding in my hands right now, will be delivered to your office. I took the liberty of adding some sticky notes and to highlight certain sections of the book for your convenience in the event that you regard reading the entire book as undeserving of your time. I will now, for the sake of holding you accountable, read the sections that I've highlighted for you, but before I do that, let me say two things. Firstly, I would like to ask everyone watching this video to like this video, to participate in the comment section and to share this video with your friends and family, because doing so, we can make this video a matter of public knowledge. And we ensure that the president takes note of the crisis and cannot claim ignorance as an excuse for not acting. Secondly, I will read your short attempt to clarify what you have said. But first, here is what you said in New York after you claimed that you will visit the USA to tell the truth about what is happening in South Africa. But on the tweet itself, he was clearly misinformed. And whoever gave him that information was completely wrong. There are no killings of farmers or white farmers in South Africa. This is what you recently said in Parliament to clarify your comments. My comment during an interview with Bloomberg on 26 September 2018 was in response to a tweet by US President Donald Trump which stated that there are large-scale killings of farmers in South Africa. As I indicated in the interview, and as I continue to maintain, this statement is incorrect and misinformed. Throughout South Africa, violent crime is a matter of serious concern regardless of where it occurs or whom it affects. The South African Police Service began reporting on the rate of murders of farmers and farm workers for the 2010-2011 financial year, during which it was reported that 80 farmers and farm workers were killed. This number has fluctuated over the years, 56 in 2011 to 12, 59 in 2012 to 13, 57 in 2014, 13 to 14, 60 in 2014 to 15, 58 in 2015 to 16, and 74 in 2016 to 17. According to the crime statistics, approximately 21,000 murders took place in South Africa in 2017 to 18, of which 62 murders occurred in farms and small holdings, which translates to approximately 0.3% of the total number of murders. We strongly condemn all murders in the country, including of farmers and farm workers, and are committed to do everything possible to defend every citizen of our country, regardless of where they live and work, from all forms of violence. We can call on all South Africans to work together with government to tackle crime and violence throughout society. Now, it is clear from your statement, which was evidently written by your advisers, that your advisers do not grasp the extent of the crisis. Debating the statistics as you have attempted to do is one thing. It is, however, a small aspect of the true extent of the crisis and only one quarter of the argument as to why farm attacks should be regarded as a priority crime. The point is, once again, that farm attacks and farm murders constitute a unique crime with unique and far-reaching consequences which justifies a counter strategy. Your denial of the extent of the crisis implies that you have not even taken the first step to addressing the crisis, which is acknowledging the crisis in the first place. 
I will read to you highlighted sections from the book to explain to you that these attacks are disproportionate in the manifestation thereof, that they are uniquely brutal and that they have major consequences for society at large. And lastly, that a focused counter strategy is above all others justified by the mere fact that farmers live in unique circumstances. On page 39, subsequently, we have often been confronted with the argument that high levels of farm attacks are only another manifestation of the fact that South Africa has high crime levels. As a matter of fact, the argument is often heard that those who complain about farm attacks and farm murders are biased because the statistics on assault and murder in South Africa's townships are said to be much worse. Some take an even harder line on this, arguing that the call for the prioritization of farm murders is racist, as the majority of people who are murdered on farms are white, while black people are murdered in higher numbers elsewhere. This is especially the argument of many politicians and certain politically inclined officers at the Department of Police. At first glance, there appears to be merit in the argument that farm murders are merely part of the fabric of an already violent society, as you have argued. Between the financial years of 2007 to 2008 and 2016 to 2017, a total of 173,428 people were murdered in South Africa. In comparison, it might seem reasonable to conclude that people complaining about several thousand farm murders need to get their priorities straight. About half a million South Africans have been murdered since 1994. And although the number of murders in South Africa has gradually declined since then, a South African still has a bigger chance of being murdered in this country than citizens in countries suffering from terror attacks, announced the Institute of Race Relations in 2017. Also in the financial year of 2015-16, 623,223 contact crimes Murder, assault, robbery and sexual offences were reported, which seems to make the number of farm attack crimes look small by comparison. The problem with the above mentioned argument is that it is based on a misunderstanding regarding the nature of statistics. These numbers cannot be compared without considering the size of the group in which these crimes took place. If the proponents of the there are more murders in townships argument were consistent, they would also have to argue that the poaching of rhinoceroses should not be prioritized, since rhinos comprise only a small minority of all animals poached in South Africa. The poaching of rhinos in South Africa is, for example, surpassed by thousands by the poaching of marine species in the Table Mountain National Park alone. The difference is, of course, that the total number of rhinos is very small and that the poaching of rhinos, if not stopped, may lead to the extinction. When the number of rhinos poached each year is compared to the total number of rhinos, the picture becomes bleaker. This is precisely the reason why murder statistics are generally determined as a ratio of victims per 100,000 of a particular group. By determining only the total number of persons murdered is not sufficient, as 100 out of 10 million is fairly low, which is 1 per 100,000, as opposed to 100 persons murdered out of 10,000 which is a thousand per a hundred thousand. AfriForum is, however, of the opinion that it is not impossible to reach plausible range estimates, especially for the rate at which commercial farmers are murdered. These calculations should be based on the number of likely commercial farmers and the proportion of the victims of farm murders who are, in fact, commercial farmers. An analysis of 1,937 victims of farm murders by Tau SA has indicated that 1,255, or 64.8%, of the victims were the farmers themselves. We might, for example, use a breakdown by the AfriForum Research, Research Institute for the financial year of 2016 to 17, which revealed that 43 of the 74 farm murders co uh, committed in that year occurred on farms as opposed to small holdings. We can then multiply that number by 64.8% to reach a closer estimate of the number of victims who were in fact farmers and not families, visitors or laborers. We can then estimate the number of commercial farmers to be somewhere between 30,000 and 35,000. 
considering all of these, the far murder rate for that year could be estimated to be somewhere between 79.6 and 92.9 per 100,000. It is conceivable that adding small holding data would increase the farmer murder rate. This should, however, not be done for the sake of calculating the murder rate due to the uncertainties about the, the number of small holdings in the country. This matter will be researched in more detail by AFRIFORUM. The farmer, the farm murder rate is extremely high. It is close to double the rate at which police officers are murdered in South Africa. This, despite the fact that one may understand police work to be dangerous while farming is not supposed to be a dangerous occupation, at least not in terms of your chances of being murdered. Using 2002 to 2003 as a reference, James Myberg, editor of Politics Web, compares the number of household robberies to the number of households in South Africa, and then also the number of farm attacks to the number of farms in South Africa. He concludes that in that year, South African farms were 16.7 times more likely to be attacked than South African households were likely to be robbed. Building on Myberg's research, Marie-Louise Antouini, a freelance journalist, calculates these numbers for the years 2013 to 2016 and concluded that farms were still up to eight or nearly nine times more likely to be attacked than other households. Myberg rightly points out that a major problem with comparing a national farmer murder rate to the national average is that most murders fall in the category of social fabric crimes. In other words, cases where someone is stabbed by an associate in a drunken brawl or a man beats his wife to death in a rage. While farm murders are, are by definition not social fabric crimes. A like-for-like -like comparison of the farm murder rate to the South African murder rate would be between the rate of farmer murders with the national rate of South Africans killed during robberies and other such crimes, explains Myberg. In their report on the 2011-2012 crime statistics, the SAPS states that 16% of murders are committed during the commissioning of other crimes. A back-of-the-envelope calculation puts the national rate for this kind of murder at just under five killings per 100,000 people. Secondly, dealing with the issue of the brutality of these attacks. During the financial year of 2016 to 2017, Victims were tortured in at least 13 or 17.6 percent of the 74 farm murders that occurred in that year. Upon his retirement after 40 years in the South African Police Service, Captain Francois Lowe said that the 17 farm murders that he had had to investigate during his career were the worst crimes he had ever seen. One of the cases Lowe had to investigate was the murder of Johan Fury. 71 years old, and his wife, Cecile, 72 years old, near Tromsberg in the Free State in September 2011. They had been hacked to death with an axe and a shovel. Lowe's sentiment is echo echoed by many serving and retired police officers. Two sisters, Rulin Skitter and Eileen de Jager, who run a company called Crime Scene Cleanup, achieved a degree of fame when the book Blood Sisters was written about their endeavours and what they have experienced on crime scenes in South Africa. An entire chapter is dedicated to farm attacks where they had to clean more than a hundred such crime scenes. The atmosphere on the scene of a farm murder is noticeably different, says De Jager. Skitter and De Jager are convinced that the term farm murders is misleading. According to these individuals who have dealt with scenes of all kinds of violent crime, including hits ordered by organized crime, the term the terms farm torture or farm terror would be more appropriate. In a farm murder, robbery is seldom the motive. Robbery is merely a side effect. Murder is the motive. Revenge, another element. Actually, after what we've seen on many different scenes, we can't help thinking that it is actually all about torture and murder. Skitter and the Jager are concerned that the brutality of farm attacks is fairly unknown among or underestimated by the general public. We now, deal to, uh, we now move to the third argument as to why these attacks need to be prioritized, which is, of course, the role that farmers have to play in our society. 
The fact that the agricultural sector represents less than 2.5% of the economy does not provide a true picture of the sector's impact on the greater economy since the sector does not operate in a vacuum. It buys inputs from the manufacturing sector, provides raw materials for manufacturing and purchases a host of services, writes Jan Greiling from the Department of Agricultural Economics at the Stellenbosch University. Adding that the agricultural and related sectors represent closer to 7% of economic activity. Moreover, the agricultural sector contributes about 12% of South Africa's total exports, making it an important earner of foreign exchange revenue. It should therefore be accepted that the significance of agriculture in the South African economy is certainly far greater than just 2.4%. The consequence of the unemployment crisis has been that political pressure is put on the agricultural sector to create more jobs. This is particularly evident in the National Democratic Plan, or the NDP, which outlines a series of proposals to boost the economy in order to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality by the year 2013. In particular, the NDP calls on the agricultural community to create 1 million jobs by 2030. Rural communities are also recognized as an economically viable group in the National Rural Safety Strategy. On the other hand, it is a known fact that employers in the agricultural community, i.e. commercial farmers, have been declining at a rapid pace. It was stated in Chapter 3 that commercial farmers have declined from more than 120,000 in the 1980s to somewhere between 30,000 and 35,000 currently. It is also estimated, estimated that this number may halve within the next 10 years. This would imply a decline by roughly 90% over 45 years. Employment in the agricultural sector has indeed shrunk, falling from nearly 1.2 million in 2001 to 800,000 in 2016. Agriculture employed 16% of the workforce in 1994, but today, that is down to 6%. The balance between exporting and importing of food has been shifting over the years. During the 1970s and 80s, South Africa exported about three times as much in agricultural products as were imported. This gap has been narrowing and exports are, are currently about one, half, one and a half times the size of imports. By 2016, agricultural export earnings amounted to 9.2 billion US dollars or 115 billion rands, while imports of agricultural food and products were 7 billion dollars or 87 billion rands. According to economist Russell Lamberti, there are three major challenges that South African commercial farmers face and that could have a significant impact on the future of agriculture in South Africa. These are macro challenges, property rights, and violent crime. With regard to violent crime, the main crisis is farm attacks. The reality of farm attacks combined with police inefficiency and government's unconcerned attitude has developed into a major crisis for South African farmers. The problem here is the opportunity cost, says Lamberti. The situation for farmers should be measured in terms of their next best alternative. Think of the prospects of the farmer's hypothetical twin brother who makes a living in a nearby town. The prospects of moving to towns or cities or of immigrating to, f to a farm abroad is becoming increasi increasingly attractive for South African farmers. If these three challenges aren't addressed, it is safe to predict a further rapid decline in the number of commercial farmers, says Lamberti. This situation is also discouraging farmers as children from making a living in agriculture, as their parents have done, which diminishes the pool of skilled agricultural human capital. Fewer skilled farmers also accelerates the trend of conglomeration and mechanization in farming. Although this trend can mitigate the impact on food output, it changes the complexion of rural areas, reduces the vibrancy of rural communities and may even lead to a permanent economic decline in small town, in small country district towns. This would cause a faster decline in farming employment than otherwise would have occurred and can also lead to a reduced economic prospects generally in rural areas and small towns. 
it should be obvious that a knock-on impact of this is it should be obvious that a knock-on impact of this is greater rates of urbanization putting pressure on already a highly strained urban infrastructure townships and job markets one effect of greater urbanization is to increase the supply of available urban labor this either depresses urban wage rates or under a minimum wage law perpetuates mass urban unemployment incubating social frustration and the many social ills that accompany mass urban poverty an additional consequence is a greater demand for urban and peri-urban land by impoverished communities leading to greater political discontent and fermentation of land invasions and policies that would further undermine property rights rural areas and country district towns are kept alive by their farming communities Farmers are usually the only producers in rural areas who sell goods to the cities and even overseas. In this way, they bring buying power into rural areas that would not otherwise exist. And this helps support rural economies and communities. Farmers therefore represent the economic lifeblood of rural societies. If farms fall into disuse or are transformed into large conglomerated commercial operations, the dynamism and economic vibrancy of small towns will be negatively affected. Other businesses that support farmers and their families will go out of business. Some small towns in South Africa have already fallen into terminal economic depression and decline as the face of farming has changed. Some of this trend is inevitable. But if the triple challenge is not addressed, it will accelerate and could impact certainly and could impact certain areas far faster and more intensively than would naturally occur. This is potentially highly destabilizing for rural societies. Those too old or too poor to move to urban areas are at risk of becoming a permanent rural underclass, totally dependent on state welfare handouts and doomed to wretched poverty. This terrible rural decay can already be felt in many far-flung parts of South Africa that most city folk never get to see. It is ironic then that the government pays so little attention to farm attacks and murders or dismisses them merely as ordinary crime. These phenomena threaten to further impoverish the very people the government claims to stand up for. Poor black people. To add insult to injury, the killing or driving to immigration of highly skilled people worsens the problem of wealth and income inequality by placing a salary premium on, high, on skilled people and worsening unemployment. Once again, for a government that claims to hate income inequality, ignoring farm attacks and farm murders will achieve the exact opposite of what it desires. Now dealing, uh, moving to the issue of the unique circumstances in which farmers find themselves. Regardless of all of the already mentioned factors, from a practical perspective, the most important motivation for the prioritization of, prioritization of farm murders is simply the fact that farmers live in unique circumstances. Farms are isolated, usually far from the nearest towns or cities, and are often accessible only by gravel roads. Intervention by members of the local South African police service and even by concerned neighbours cannot take place within a matter of minutes. The circumstances of farmers certainly cannot be compared to those of citizens living in urban areas. I don't think the public knows that the attackers often spend hours on the scenes of farm murders, says Eileen de Jager from Crime Scene Cleanup. Remember, it's normally in a remote area with nobody around to hear the victims scream and plead. There are reported cases of farm attacks and tortures being executed over time frames extending up to five or even nine hours, says Roland de Vries, a retired Major General of the South African National Defence Force. We see how they even prepared food and ate during the torture. We see how they took their time with the torture, says de Jager. To burn somebody with a heated dropper, an iron pole normally used in a farm's fencing, takes time. To sharpen a broomstick before you push it up a woman's private parts takes time. 
The remoteness of many of South Africa's farms implies that they are situated far from police stations and even reaction time from the police might take several hours. On top of that, the South African Institution for Civil Engineering found in 2018 that between 88 and 98 percent of South Africa's dirt roads can be described as either bad or very bad. Richard Stofberg, 74 years old, was ambushed on his farm near Rustenburg in the northwest on 27 March 2017. After returning from shopping, he was attacked upon his arrival at the farmhouse by two men presumed to be teenagers. He was repeatedly beaten in the face with the backside of an axe, threatened with a revolver and tied to the bed with electric cables and wires. The attackers then left him there and fled the scene. Stofberg was tied up so tightly that he was unable to free himself. He soon realized that he would have to wait there in the hope of someone coming to his aid. Eventually, he spent four nights being tied up before help finally arrived. I was lying in my own urine and my throat was dry and sore. I struggled to shout for help, he said. Even if the other factors that contribute to the uniqueness of farm attacks were irrelevant, this factor alone, the fact that farmers live in unique circumstances where they are far away from their neighbours and far away from police stations is sufficient to acknowledge that farm attacks should be countered with a unique counter strategy. Mr. President, there was great anticipation of your presidency. Your denial of the extent of the crisis has had a major impact on the victims and those affected by these acts of terror. You need to prove that you are the president of South Africa and not only for those who support your party, but for all who live in it. Respect should be earned, Mr. President. Please earn it. <laughs>